Hi, I'm Will. And I'm Luke. And this is Will, Will and Luke, Luke Discuss. A vodcast. And podcast. Where we discuss content related to psychology, personal growth, self-development, and well-being. This, this episode, episode, we're discussing the social chemistry by Marissa King. So social chemistry, decoding the patterns of human connection. So I thought it's a really interesting book, which is basically about how we, as people, um, expand our networks, how we communicate with others, do the people we know know each other, how do we engage with various um, various cliques in our life, different um yeah, different social circles, like how do we operate as a person within our friendships and how do we typically meet other people? Um, brought in some like really interesting concepts. She talks about, and um, we'll get into these obviously, but you know, like you're either a broker, an expansionist or a convener. And then she also gets into um, stuff a bit later on, basically about like how to make friends and how to connect with people in the moment and how to, um, you know, throw yourself into the mix of meeting new people in your life and also kind of stuff around finding a work-life balance as well so yeah. there's a pl- there's plenty of really really interesting ideas here that i really enjoyed i thought it was a super well written book and um yeah it certainly got me thinking about like how do i know the people that i'm friends with and how will i continue to make new friends in my life and which social circles do i tend to operate in and on a personal level how can i operate um better when meeting new people or with my existing friendships so nice yeah yeah so it's definitely it's a book about relationships right but rather than I don't know something like nonviolent communication, where it's more about the one-to-one interactions. It starts off as much more like, "What's a bird's eye view of kind of all your relationships? How do how do the patterns of our networks in life look?" And mm. she, yeah, as you pointed out, she highlights three main patterns that people tend to either build or fall into fairly unconsciously, and they all have their kind of pros and cons in life. And as mm-hmm. you then say later on in the book, we, we she kind of dives deeper into those networks and talks about, you know, what if you want to achieve some of the pros from these different types of networking, how do you go about it? Um, and how do you kind of avoid some of the, the pitfalls that are uh, some of the downsides of these types of networks she talks about? Mm. I think the um, you know the 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 three styles of networks she talks about so um, brokers, conveners, expansionists. And she's saying that these three styles each come with their own you know psychological tendencies, outcomes, interactions um, are quite often determined by the day to day context in which they're in in the in the way you you form and maintain the relationships you've got. So she, she talks at the beginning a bit about you know kind of um, often we we communicate in dyads, so one on one relationships. And then also we we operate in networks, which are groups of interconnected people. So that's kind of um, the whole idea of one plus one equals three and like how do the people you know know each other? What are the connections? And she gives a few diagrams that um, I imagine you might throw up throughout this uh, uh, on the YouTube video, but certainly like thinking a bit about like what are the ties we have as well? You know, so we have like strong ties between people, people we know well and have quite deep right. relationships with. But then also she acknowledges the the weak ties we have, which kind of keep us connected and keep us accessing new types of information and like a bit more of a diverse network with people maybe we don't know necessarily as well, but we are connected to through kind of uh, maybe more indirect ways. Right. So there's yeah. the network yeah. themselves and how these different nodes may connect with one another or mm. not. But then there's yeah. how strong are these nodes? So yeah, how yeah. how deep is a relationship versus you know how many really close ties do you have versus how many kind of acquaintances versus how many people do you mm. kind of know the name of? And you could perhaps ask for help, but you would tend not to invite round mm. for dinner and open up yeah. to something like that. Yeah, and also the the nature in which you maintain those ties. Like, do you maintain them through kind of like? You know, once a year, do you call these people or are these people yeah. you see every day at work or people like you see quite regularly? But um, yeah, so brings in a few concepts around that. I think um, before we get into the three types, it'd just be interesting what she says about, um, you know, there's that, that old concept of like you only know, you know, Dunbar's number of, you know, most of us have 150 people in our lives that we can steadily maintain as a friendship. And I, she goes through kind of um you know the breakdown of different numbers so it says your your inner circle of friends yeah. you know your your strong ties are typically between two to five people who we turn to in times of distress yeah. and then beyond that um typically around 15 people is your sympathy sympathy group so these are people who we feel emotionally close to and then she says we've got close friends which is around 50 people which is people you would have 
at a barbecue, yeah. but you wouldn't tell them a close secret. Yeah. And then there's like casual friends slash stable contacts who are around 150 people. And she's saying at this point, that's when reciprocity ends and obligation ends as well. <laughs> yeah. So that's when we kind of, we don't expect anything back from them, but we kind of, we know them as friends. And then there's like acquaintances, which is between 450 to 600 people, um, people we have seen, but don't keep in touch with. Yeah. And then there's people we, we recognize by sight, which is up to like 1500 people. Cool. So yeah, yeah. I just find, I find that like quite an interesting breakdown, you know, talk about like, what is a friend and she's defining a friend as it's like, it's all based on the, like the amount of time, the emotional intensity, the intimacy and the reciprocity that is involved in that relationship. Yeah. But yeah. yeah well, that's quite interesting. Like how, how she defines a friend. In that yeah, sense. Well, well, it reminds me of um, when we did games people play, you know, transactional analysis and the different types of interactions you can have from, you know, like game playing or um, mm, mm. down to like intimacy. And it sounds like it's, it's down at intimacy where you consider someone kind of close and then, yeah, you might have. I guess they take this number, I, th I think, from like evolutionary terms and in terms of like the, the types of tribes you would have um, evolved in. Mm. But yeah, they, they say mm. that it's about 150 people you can actually keep a sort of a account of. And as you say, like beyond that are people you don't necessarily feel any ties or obligations to do anything for. Mm -hmm. It's um, she she talks a bit about, you know, what influences like how we become friends with people as well so i think we're given quite a nice overview here of like what's going on but she says yeah. like you know pr proximity and location plays a part yeah. your life stage plays a part your general personality and your approach to meeting new people um you know kind of like where you sit in the office the exposure yeah. you have to certain <laughs> people like the amount of repeated interactions you have with other people and i guess the the social proximity to certain groups i, I just thought it's really interesting to think about you know what um social situations have i been in and where do my, yeah. most of my friends come from and like yeah. if i didn't happen to be in the same class as somebody yeah. would i be in the same would we be friends and it's I, I think more and more it kind of crossed my mind that there's just some people who like i will probably never be friends with because like we'll never kind of cross paths like if i don't yeah. study am i going to become friends with someone who studies history at my university if there's no other connection other than the university I yeah mean, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get into this but it's a uh, it's certainly interesting to think about, like, if you're really honest about how you know people, a lot of the time it's kind of just like proximity or yeah. just kind of some some vague, convenient relationship that kind of like led you guys to be yeah. friends or something. Yeah. And also it's, it, but it, it also doesn't mean that just proximity will then equate to intimacy. Like, because she talked about, you know, you could know someone at the workplace for, for years and say hi to them pretty much every day, but still have very, like, zero intimacy with them and never really have opened up about much of anything yeah. um so yeah it's like proximity obviously plays a role with who you can meet and how you can get close but it doesn't mm. it's not the only factor is it in in mm. getting close with someone and you know thinking as well about you know life stages as well like how priorities change yeah. as you get older she's saying like you know you, you peak with the most people you know typically around age 25 and then as yeah. your priorities change as you get older then that changes too yeah yeah both in terms of like family life if you started to like settle down with a partner have children then obviously you've got so much fewer <clears throat> time and energy and emotional resources for other people mm. but also in work life she's saying that like when you're young and starting on your career it helps to uh kind of know as many people as you can in the field like it helps to because yeah. any one of them can be helpful for you because you're at the bottom whereas like the, the higher you get <laughs> the the less helpful it is and, and, and in fact it can also become a hindrance to have too many people then like contacting you all the time so it's almost yeah. like yeah the further the higher the ladder you climb the more uh the less incentive you have to hang on to like a wide array of of um people mm -hmm. it's more about quality then in terms of mm -hmm. you know what can this person kind of how can we help each other rather than just the more people the better yes yes yeah i think um be good good um good time to kind of switch across to what she uh, that she refers to as the three types yeah of, let's um, do it kind of um well, what would you call them like types of people types she of refers networks. to in like yeah. types, types of networks yeah so I, I wonder, it defines um, it defines yeah. the type of network but it also yeah it it it's a label for the type of person who's likely yeah. to build that particular network. Mm. So um, I'm, 
I was thinking of maybe starting with expansionists, unless okay. uh, you were, yeah, yes, just because just we kind of referred to like what you were just saying about, you know, sometimes like knowing a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so I guess uh, I'll do my best to kind of just like um, draw on a few things I've kind of noted down here about expansionists. But yeah. Please kind of uh, please jump in. So basically, she's saying that they've got like large and wide networks and kind of typically knows people on like a one to one um, basis. Right. So, so um, the key is that they yeah, know loads yeah. and loads of people is the general idea, but the people they know don't necessarily yeah. particularly like know one, one another. One. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you've yeah. got this node yeah. in the middle. I'll put it on the screen for the video, but for the audio, you've got a node in the middle, which is you, and you've got like legs coming off this node, which is your ties mm. to uh, perhaps everyone you know. But yeah. between those people you know, they don't necessarily have any links between each other. You just know a lot of people is the fundamental defining mm -hmm. factor of the expansionist and so saying a lot um you know that they they favor weaker ties they um expend a lot of energy meeting new people they yeah. typically find it quite easy to end relationships because of those those weaker ties and often there's not a lot a lot of like reciprocal um obligations so they do know more than the average person but you just kind of think of someone who knows a lot of people but without a particular level of depth um, yeah, it's I, an inherent yeah. payoff, right? You, or not payoff, but a kind of, uh, you, you can even put a lot of time and energy into many, many, many people, or you can put that same amount of time and energy into a few people, in which case those relationships would be deeper, but you can't, yeah. you can't really have it both ways because there's only so much yeah. time in the day and only so much cognitive and emotional capacity you have. So yeah, mm -hmm. this is the type of person that goes for spread myself thin across as many people as possible. Mm. And they tend to be, um, you know, kind of quite popular with those people, quite good with people, good at reading others, you're saying, you know, quite confident communicators, good listeners, like very able to kind of uh, establish a, some sort of relationship quite quickly. Yeah. Um, t typically. But yeah, the, I guess the downsides is, yeah, they spread themselves too thin. They're, it can often, if there are any obligations and expectations within those relationships, like it's quite hard to maintain when you've got so many people yeah. you're trying to kind of um, not please or you know, fulfill obligations to. So um, I think that, that that kind of ties in a bit to, you know, kind of uh, people who mainly have a lot of like online friends or something or people who kind of, you know, engage in quite shallow ways with people. Like they often might end up knowing a lot of people but not having any mm. friends. They kind of, that whole concept of feeling like lonely, although they know a lot of people. Yeah, so she, I think she, yeah. uh, in the book, highlighted a few celebrities. I think she quoted Selena Gomez as saying like, yeah. I know everyone, but I don't have a friend, something like that. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, and and. I guess oh, cool. I'll also yeah, yeah. point out yeah. in, in this in this stage yeah. that we might talk about these as as a type of person, but she also said that you know we might change our networks at different life stages. So we we mm. could refer to an expansionist, but you might be an expansionist, you know, for a few years whilst you're at university or something. But it doesn't yeah. mean that yeah. that's how you spend your life either, or even in a certain aspect of your life, you yeah. could be that at work, or you could be um yeah yeah. I know also I guess you know thinking of it as kind of um elements of a, a personality is like in some ways you know you can be more expansionist yeah you might lean at that certain way. times yeah you might lean that way but in other ways you're like actually no i do i do have quite a lot of like deep friendships but also i've got like a lot of shallow ones as well so it's yeah i guess it's um yeah a good good to flag that that it's kind of intermovable and we're not kind of like chucking people into three different boxes and that's yeah kind of for the rest of life it's not like fixed is it yeah well i think i think when i was reflecting on this i was i'm probably i've probably been my most exp expansionist when just traveling on my own um for a number of factors but one is that you you've just got all the time in the day to meet people right you, you've not got a job to maintain so like and because you're moving from location to location and the people you meet are moving to you don't necessarily invest a lot in in you, you might end up just having lunch with one person once and never seeing them again kind of yeah. thing so so that's definitely the kind of um network you can fall into if you do some sort of longer term travel i've noticed mm. and people would i guess kind of drop off quite easily i suppose yeah, over go time. There. yeah. you know you're on different yeah. paths right you're going in different directions yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um conveners is the uh next type so um that that one kind of inter interpreters like this person's friends typically tend to be friends. It's like quite yeah. a high trust, um, very connected, very dense relationships, um, yeah. like a lot, a lot of depth, you know, that, and she says this is the best one to like fight against, you know, loneliness later in life. Yeah. Um, but they, I think the bit that stood out for me, particularly with conveners is that they devote a lot of time 
to maintenance. Like they really put time into maintaining the current relationships that they do have at the potential expense of not trying to find new relationships. Yeah. They kind of like, they work on the ones they've got. They, um, they self-disclose, they engage in very like reciprocal relationships. Um, a lot of like high level perspective taking, like being able to understand what the other person thinks of them, like very in tune with others, which leads to a lot of depth and a lot of trust um, and a lot of vulnerability in their relationships. Yeah. Um, that's kind of how th- there were some of the key things I picked up. Yeah. So if you were trying yeah. to visualize this network, if you're uh, listening just on audio, it's like if you're one node in this network, you've got ties to all these other nodes, but all the other nodes all have ties to each other. So it's like a kind of like a clique. You, you, everyone sort of knows each other and you're all embedded in the same, mm. like I'm, I'm thinking like small communities. I've like been uh, watching Downton Abbey, at Downton Abbey recently. And like, I'm thinking like that is such a good example yeah. of conveners because everyone knows everyone like, and yeah, that they're, they're all in a tight knit community. Don't really let outsiders into the community. And so you, yeah, a convener, you know, you're likely to, I don't know, invite people into your home. Your family's likely to know your friends, your work friends are likely to know your non-work friends, that sort of thing. You're mismatched and you're you're all in there together. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. And brokers is the uh, final um, one of the three. I think we, um, by the way, I moved on quickly because I felt like you covered, (laughs) you covered everything I (laughs) <laughs> as well so that was good yeah cool and then brokers um basically saying that they straddle different social circles different worlds they're quite good at bringing yeah. people together high self-monitoring typically have quite a good work-life balance so you're thinking of someone who kind of um in a way kind of like has all these different pockets of people they engage with yeah but they're like kind of deep with within those but they do like there is there is also some kind of um you know, some some weak ties as well because they're involved in so many different yeah. networks. They're able to have access to lots of different information, lots of different perspectives. Yeah. Um, tend to be quite like diverse thinkers, new opinions, able to generate new ideas. Um, and they're quite good at like adapting to new circumstances as well. You know, kind of they're able to straddle different social circles quite easily yeah. and quite Which, comfortably. So if you think of like a stockbroker, right? They're the sort of the middle person between you and the, and the stock and the company of the stocks you're buying. And you can mm. think of a broker as kind of like the, the, the go between between groups of conveners, let's say. Yes. So yeah. a, a, a broker might kind of have a foot in the door in a lot of cliques a lot of groups but those different groups don't necessarily know one another but but um Mm. but they can know them via the broker so the broker is quite good at kind of bringing can be quite good at bringing different people together certainly for like work projects and stuff not necessarily so much for intimacy but um Mm. so yeah you can imagine if you're trying to visualize this that if you're this middle node in the network you might have quite a few lines leading off to different groups of let's say conveners perhaps that different Mm -hmm. cliques and groups that you know of and if you're kind of in need of um like new information or accessing a person to help with something like because you you've you've got your foot in so many doors you can um you can kind of get access to those perspectives or that help quite easily yeah these might be the type of people you go to to like ask for something because they're likely to know more about it than anyone in your, in your convenience yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 they're, they're, yeah, they're cool. the type of person they'll know a mechanic and a doctor and a good chiropractor and like they'll know all the different people because yeah. they're in all the different circles yeah and she would um she would say that they know they would typically know so if they go like how many people do you know called like ben they would typically yeah. know like quite a few bens right you know because they yeah. know like <laughs> they've yeah. got like okay. quite wide networks as well yeah 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 cool i think that's you know i think that's probably you know a good good explanation i think it gives, took me a while to kind of get my head around it. i suppose like it did uh she's kind of speak about them ongoing throughout the book you know yeah. did a chapter on each but what i found really interesting was within each chapter kind of brought up some some interesting ideas um and it g- gets me thinking about you know yeah as i say how do i meet the people that i have i met the people that i know how do i expand my networks who like who's fits in my closest circle who are the yeah. periphery people why for what reasons do people come and go from from my life um i think uh some uh, a chapter i particularly liked was one she called uh it was in the mix it's talking about and made me think a lot about um carpe uh so sorry um so i'll start again uh, the one in the moment which yeah. was um you know think about like how do we develop and maintain our relationships 
in that very moment. It made me think a lot yeah. about the Carpe Diem book we did um, yeah. did recently. You know, like we we have a need for um, you know for like certainty, and we have a need for like reciprocal relationships and connecting yeah. with people. But like, how do we in the moment to moment interactions? Um, engage with people and I guess she gives some ideas you know talks a bit about you know the importance of like eye contact and you know, uh, it's quite so, a profound yeah. thing and talk about the importance of you know listening and the importance yeah. of touch and the impact of phone use you know I'm kind of throwing a lot out there and yeah. you know, thinking also about the questions we ask people when we engage with them I, I wonder if anything stood out for you in, in that chapter well, well just what I'm you said then. All at you. yeah, yeah um, reminded yeah. me yeah how, how well I think uh, the digital minimalism book tied into this because yeah mm. just, uh, earlier in the book i think marissa king spoke a lot about how yeah phone use can be and you know studies that show it being very detrimental to intimacy and relationships so it's like mm. they did mm. this one experiment where all you do is just have the phone face down on the table and yes. you control to see you know how um intimate and close people found the interactions and if you're having a very shallow conversation having a phone on the table didn't seem to affect it very much but if you were talking mm. about something much more deep and important to you uh the phone just the phone being there not anyone looking at it not it going off but just it being in visual sight was yeah, very yeah, off-putting yeah. to people and and m made mm. them feel much le like less secure and safe in in the conversation so it's an interesting one because on the one hand she's talking about how do we maintain networks that most are best for us and most benefit our lives at certain points in our lives and then she talks about how you know different ways phone use can be quite um damaging to those what you were just talking about there they're sort of really in the moment here and now maintaining communication mm. with someone um but it raised a lot of questions right of like well then how would you use your phone to maintain these like, so, yeah array of networks you have and that sort of thing which i guess the last book we covered answered really but um it's just interesting to note that it was it i thought it was also interesting she said like actually the impact of phone use on like the amount of people you know and the types of people you know yeah. isn't actually that different from in real life it, referring to kind of like if you look at the people who are in your life yeah. It's typically kind of like the same sorts of people you would have online. She, she was saying there wasn't like a whole heap of difference, but I think mm. the, you know, at a broader, I was talking about in the moment here, but at a broader level, I think it, what it does is it kind of keeps a lot more of those kind of in the fray relationship, the ones kind of like the outer edge yeah. relationships um, around obviously a lot longer than yeah. you would in real life. You know, you think if you kind of like add someone on Facebook, you like met them for lunch once when you were traveling, like yeah. that you kind of just end up like seeing their life story pop up. You're probably not actually <laughs> going to talk to them again later right. in your life. You know, it's, I, I think that certainly has a, has an impact for sure. Yeah. 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 It's kind of, you know, it's, it's like, we've got a kind of a, uh, yeah, like a world outside of ourselves almost. Like we kind of got like an online persona mm. that kind of engages with people or gives people thumbs up and gives, you know, is, yeah. that, is that friendship? Like what, what's, what role is that friendship playing in your life? Yeah. So although the network's not necessarily particularly different in real life as it is online, you're probably more likely to sort of just about maintain the weaker ties for a lot longer yes. than you would in, yeah. re in reality. Mm. Um, so I guess going back to what you were saying, yeah, the, those kind of like, uh, it sounded like you were interested in not, yeah, it, the, right on the ground level in the present moment here and now, when we're interacting yeah. with someone, whether it's uh, a close friend or a colleague, or even uh, she talked about talking to the barista at the cafe or whatever it is, like, mm. what do we, how do we uh, interact? What patterns do we get into that either kind of help or hinder the way we stay mm. in touch with people? Um, she talked a lot about empathy, didn't she? And giving people yeah. space yeah. and genuinely asking people how they are is again reminds me of games people play again it's like the giving each other strokes and that sort of thing but well i love the questions bit but here like yeah. brings up you know um D dale carnegie's like how to win friends and influence people yeah. you know she says like basically that people like answering questions about themselves yeah. you know yeah. so she's um you know she, she was saying that like ask questions that the other person will enjoy answering um, which I quite liked. And then there's the yeah. uh, six different types of questions. So there's like introductory mm. questions, full switch questions where you just kind of like change the topic all of a sudden, yep. a partial switch, follow-up questions, mirroring. Yeah. So kind of like they ask how your day was, to ask how their day was. Yeah. And then like rhetorical <laughs> ones. And what, what she was saying is that um, follow-up questions are the ones that really kind of develop relationships. Yeah. So someone goes like, oh, I'm, uh, 
I know I'm picking up my my child from school late and then following up with like, oh, how old's your child? What's you like, yeah, you know, yeah. what school do they get? Like basically saying that people really enjoy talking about themselves. So if you're kind of trying to develop friendships and get to know people, like you have to ask questions that they want to answer. I guess it yeah. just really, it got me like thinking about like, oh, you know, it would be nice to like be a bit more open to like, just asking the guy at the coffee shop how his day is going and like yeah. take a bit more interest and in kind of being less transactional and sort yeah. of opening up more doors to making new friends and not say necessarily like just people in coffee shops, but just in general, like yeah, yeah. ask questions to make friends. Yeah. No, now you've uh, raised that. It, it, it reminded me that stood out to me at the time as well, because you can, you know, in, in, um, I don't know, any listening skills, workshops, whatever you might do. They talk about the value of asking questions and certainly asking open questions, but she really kind of defined the different types of questions. It's quite different to really shift gears and, you know, be talking about the football and then just shift to asking about, you know, how they're finding the weather or, or something versus yeah. a follow-up question, which really shows that, um, what well, one that you've actually heard the last thing they've said because <laughs> you can't mm. ask a follow-up question unless you've understood what the someone's just said beforehand yeah, yeah. And, and also that you're interested and in that you know you're inviting them to uh, share a bit about themselves so yeah mm. you can really mm. uh see why that's um something to kind of promote in your in these small day-to-day -day interactions I like I do like how the book took a shift to that so you know I was kind of saying to you before I got on the podcast I find yeah. the you know, thinking about like how you, you make networks as a, a style, but also as like a personality, you know, as a yeah. person, like how, what do you like? But also it kind of, it does get into that. Like, you know, what is it, what is it that really kind of like creates and maintains friendship? It's, it's about like openness. It's about like listening. Like yeah. she talks about, you know, effective listening. Like, do you grasp the meaning and emotion of what the person's saying? And then yeah. like ethical listening, like listening without judgment and, yeah. you know, are you like behavioral? Like, do you actually engage with people when they're talking to you? Like, are they, are you actually listening? Are you showing a level of presence with them when you're talking to them? It's, mm. it, it just really gets me thinking. I get quite like excited thinking about it. Cause I'm like, oh, yeah. that's the way we got to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and th there's a bit earlier on, I'm, I'm just flicking back through my notes. Here. She's basically saying like, we're, and because of technology, yep. potentially and because of modern life, like we're so often in a rush. We're always yeah. trying to like, we don't actually slow down and connect with people. And she's saying like, often like sometimes just doing like nothing, just being there, not kind of looking for your phone or thinking about where you are next. Like yeah. that's damaging our ability to make friendships. If we're constantly yeah. wanting to be somewhere else other than where we are. Like, we're yeah, gonna... I can see why you brought up the carpe diem. But, <laughs> Cause it's like, if you get yeah. into that habit consistently, then you're just foregoing so many opportunities to connect. I started smiling then. Cause what you just said reminded me of yeah. that. Um, Good Samaritan experiment she talked about. Oh, I'll get into that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so obviously, um, the Bible story, the Good Samaritan, it's like there's this um, guy on the side of the road that's, I think he's injured, is he, or, or at least starving, something. And two two people walk by, and it's it's the Samaritan that stops and, and helps him out. So anyway, they took this idea and and tried to see, you know, who who would stop and why and what affects it. So they, um, I think it was even, they did it with priests, did they, if I remember rightly? Yeah, and they, yeah they, who, they were about, got, who were about to go and give a sermon about, the, about the Good the Samaritan. Good Samaritan. Yeah. And, <laughs> Too um, good. So they, they did, that was one group. Another group was someone who was about to give a speech on something completely different. And, um, and then they staged a a man who was clearly uh, distressed and injured. And I think coughed and, mo and moaned out twice for help or something. So like, it was the same for each person that walked by and whether it was a priest about to give a lecture on the good Samaritan or, or a, a non priest giving a random lecture, they, they stopped about the same amount. So that was the first mm. thing that's quite interesting. The second thing was <laughs> if, um, if they told the priests that, you know, this lecture starts in 10 minutes and the building's 10 minutes away. So like if they made them feel like they were in a rush, <laughs> it, was all, yeah. it was something like uh, uh, almost 90% of people just stepped over this guy who was oh, injured and calling out for help. <laughs> so oh it's like, like, yeah, I guess it was making the point that even a priest on his way to give a, a speech about the Good Samaritan, if in a rush and in a hurry, is is likely to... Mm. even not just be blind to or or just ignore that kind of thing 
Um, it's amazing. It's just such a strong, amazing, amazing example. Isn't yeah. It? <laughs> yeah. 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 So really, I think at um, that point you're saying about like, if we're feeling in a hurry or in a rush, how detrimental that can be to our sort of daily interactions with other people. Mm. And I feel that entirely, you know, I, I think maybe stronger, maybe a few years ago, but I, I remember like catching myself once being like, I'm not, because I'm constantly like in a rush wanting to be somewhere else or wanting yeah. to, um, you know, that I'm, it's actually affecting my level of eye contact and how much I listen. And like people are kind of talking, but you're like, you're already out the door whilst they're yeah. like telling you how their day is. Like you're kind of waiting for them to finish, like telling you how yeah, their day yeah. is so you can kind of get out of the room. That's like a really unhealthy way of building friendships. Um you know, like that, that's kind of like the extreme example. If I was in like an ultimate rush, that yeah, I would yeah. like, you wouldn't be willing to engage. I think uh, another barrier, um, she says to, you know, and uh, of you know, building friends and communication. You know, kind of getting into that as well as you know, around we're quite fearful of speaking up. Like often, people want to preserve the peace. We have a fear of being unliked. Um, we kind of we have a need for, um, you know, kind of not stir in the pot too much mm. and you know that actually can affect our friendships what she's saying like makes a good um a good environment is you know psychological safety which is built uh, yeah. by you know de- dependability having good um good structures and particularly in a workplace like having role clarity as well and creating a safe space for us to like speak up yeah. which is like risk-free and free of blame but if we kind of expand that to like the day-to-day sense like you know be able yeah. to create with your friends a level of depth in which you can say things without fear of blame, without risk of being judged. I think that's what develops really good friendships, isn't it? Like you can kind of just come to them as you are. You know, at the beginning as well, um, she talks a bit about um, we don't connect as well with people because we don't feel authentic. And that relates to, you know, aspects of like our own self-acceptance, our own self-awareness. Um, are we like consistent in our behaviors, beliefs? Are we open and truthful? Like all of those things are affected by kind of um, fears we carry into yeah. into relationships. And I guess if the, the more authentic we feel, the more able we are to kind of like accept our feelings right. and share those vulnerably with other people. And she refers to that as um, social faculty. Like what do we do with that awareness of our own vulnerability and our own fallibility right. in order to develop and deepen friendships? Right. So you can look at that from two angles, right? You can look at it from yourself as an individual, as your character, like how and when do I practice and are able to be sort of like candid and open and vulnerable. But she was also focusing on kind of group dynamics and how do you create, uh, as you say, that Mm. psychological safety in a group where people feel okay to express themselves. And um, I shouldn't laugh because it's not funny, but but (laughs) one of the examples she brought up was... um, uh, it was a real story. This this plane um, on an aeroplane, one of the engines went bust, and there was like smoke filling up the cabin, and people were screaming and everything. And um, the the pilot announced that look, one, our our right engine has has gone bust. I'm going to have to shut it down and land at the nearest airport. And but everyone on kind of like like there was a, a group of witnesses that all said they could see it wasn't the the right engine. It was the left engine. Like they could see yeah. smoke coming out the left one. And, um, and no one kind of mentioned, like they all kind of thought that like, well, I, I must, what do I know? Who, who am I to say something yeah. like if, if, yeah. if he's saying it's the right one, it's the right one, even though with their own eyes, they could see the smoke and the fire <laughs> coming out the left engine. Oh and oh he man. ended up shutting down the wrong engine and, and they crashed and loads of people died and stuff. Um, and yeah, a few survivors, oh, that must be a worse position to be in. A few of the survivors were the people who saw and just didn't speak up. So like one of yeah. the cabin crew and yeah. it's like... <laughs> um, they never held themselves back again, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. But they, yeah. T- she talks about, you know, how that's so common in, in the most important areas of life, like in hospitals and like nurses and who just are terrified to stand up to the doctors because they know the culture just won't allow that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to, in order, th- there's there's our own. We've talked a lot about honesty and lying in this in this podcast series, but like there's our own virtues in doing that, right? But there's also like the group dynamics that allow that safety for us to be that way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And ability to kind of um, well, obviously there might be like a certain level of like self awareness and you yeah. know a level of you know kind of understanding yourself, but actually being able to express that with other people. Yeah like that often is kind of affected by like the culture or the dynamics of the the workplace or the friendship group. You know, I think yeah. you know, there's some types of friendship groups where you just wouldn't, it'd be kind of really out of place to like 
talk about your feelings or talk about exactly yeah. what's going on or even it'd be it'd feel difficult to be consistent in your behaviors if they weren't being accepted or even yeah. consistent in your beliefs or hard to be truthful because that wasn't the culture or the the expectation of that certain social group as well yeah which um to some degree ties into uh, how like to be a good expansionist or broker which kind of requires you to be able to be a bit more chameleon like and fit into different mm, uh mm. group situations um i think it was the broker she was talking about mainly who could like enter these different groups and still manage to sort of get by and fit in even even though or oh, that she talked about politicians as well, who, who like depending on the town they're in, what might give very different speeches, almost that contradict one another, just to sort of mm, please mm. the audience they're speaking to, yeah. which would be taking it to the extreme, I guess. What, what was she saying? Was the um, the she's kind of saying like a, a good way to be is kind of like be a broker for a bit and then be a convener and then kind of go back to brokering. So like in terms of kind of oscillating between those two, so it's like go and put yourself out there find new networks find new people but then like deepen yourself into yeah. those and then kind of um you know find find your tribe find your people and then kind of once you start to get a bit too comfortable mm -hmm. like step back out again and do more mm -hmm. do more kind of broken it broke brokering yeah yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah so yeah. it's kind of what we we're saying earlier right that although we have these labels we don't necessarily have to stick with one or, or we stay in the same one throughout our different stages of life and and yeah so some of the i think she implied that the convener people who kind of live in a convener type network is probably the best for your kind of psychological and emotional health because you've just got such like tight knitted community around you that yeah. it's very safe but one of the cons to that is you can get stuck in bubbles and echo chambers you're hearing the same values and opinions espoused by everyone around you Mm -hmm. And so to kind of uh, expand yourself, I guess, she, she, as you just mentioned there, recommends sort of occasionally breaking out of that, trying new groups, going to different yes. things, different clubs, different yeah. environments you yeah. wouldn't usually put yourself in and just sort of expanding your horizons for a bit and then, and then nestling back into your convener networks mm. to find that safety again and that, um, mm. yeah, that, that warmth, and that community. Real, real. I think you've really summarised like a, a real key takeaway here about you know kind of how how we can utilise these um, these styles to to our benefits, and also just having the awareness of like, oh, maybe I'm getting a bit comfortable with my current group of friends, so maybe I can kind of put this on more of a like a maintenance level friendship as opposed to kind of a the only friendship I have in my life. Mm. Like kind of like expanding yourself out and being willing to meet new people or put yourself in new situations. I am. Um, I was interested, I guess, um, kind of as we're you know heading towards the end here, just to talk about um, what she talks about uh, the uh, work-life balance um, scenario here, which I thought yeah. was super interesting. So, because um, this is something I've certainly thought about a lot, is like how do I um, how do I maintain you know boundaries between work and whether that's yeah. like you know work um, like the hours I work or like how much do I disclose at the workplace to colleagues? And yeah. it really does depend on the type of workplace you're oh, in. Yeah. I think yeah. it's, um, you know, it's, um, she's basically saying like, try and find a job that matches your current need for integration or segregation. So she defines yeah. that there's two ways people tend to operate in maintaining their work-life balance. There's yeah. like segmenters. So people who are able to keep things absolutely separate yeah. have like yeah. um you know very firm walls don't like to think work about work outside of work yeah. and like the concept of having work mates like talk to them outside of work is a bit yeah. of a threat yeah but then there's integrators who are a bit more happy to like have a bit more of a blend share about their family yeah. life bring multiple parts of their identity to work with. yeah um and i, I thought it's, it's interesting because i i feel like i i typically in my mind i'm quite a segmenter in regards yeah. to um, you know, in terms of doing like overtime, doing shifts, if I don't kind of, if I don't want to pick up an extra shift, I won't. Um, typically, I've been very good at like leaving on time, not talking about work too much outside of work. I guess I'll just throw, throw at you all my ideas. I'm just interested yeah. to hear what your ideas are. Um, I typically don't like to talk about work outside of work too much because of like the nature of the work is kind of speaking about people with their, you know, um, you know, while they come, you know, in mental health field, in the helping profession, 
professions often yeah. people are coming to you with like you know a lot of different um concerns and things to work through so it's not something you want to kind of bring something i want to bring home but then in terms of like the bit that stuff me is like what parts of my identity do i bring to work and it's actually like it's actually quite useful to bring like the the humorous side of me to work the yeah. um like the really motivated person to work the person who like just different aspects of my personality I can bring to work. So I don't kind of go into work with just like a single minded focus on yeah, like, yeah. I'm this person in the workplace and I don't go outside of that. It's actually quite useful, particularly in our line of work to bring some, some kind of authenticity, like well, yeah, show, yeah. Si- show sides of yourself, actually reveal who, who you are and your genuine reactions. Whereas maybe some jobs require you to be a bit more, um, bit more tunnel visioned i'd say so anyway that's my uh, that's my thoughts on work-life balance and something I, I i it did stand out to me as a great section in this book so yeah it's yeah. a good point so um i guess just to recap some of that then yeah the, the segregators as you say you know if there's a work party they're really unlikely to bring their spouse or family along to it and equally if they're having a family party they're really not going to feel comfortable inviting people from work to it whereas an integrator might love doing all that and like their work and life is sort of as the word suggests integrated into each other sounds like these are more likely to be convenience whereas the segregationists are more likely to be uh, yeah. brokers um but no i really hear what you're saying that you're putting up yet you, you feel that you've got importantly strong boundaries around like when your work starts and stops but but in the work itself there's a level of um congruence authenticity that especially in the helping profession social work it's important to bring your real humanity with you so that can't really be left at the door as maybe it could in a more corporate world um yes so it's really interesting yeah i mean Mm. when i looked at these networks and sort of reflecting on myself i thinking well broker probably stands out to be my pattern most of all like i'm thinking that my yeah, my my work colleagues didn't know any of my yoga group, who didn't know of any of my football club, who don't really know any yeah. of my family, who don't really know of any of my friends. Yeah. So, like, it, when I was looking at my own network, I'm like, yeah, I'm quite quite broker like. Um, and then, as you mentioned, work. Then, obviously, as a therapist or a social worker, you with your clients, obviously, there's a strict boundary of like you don't socialize with them outside of work. So, so mm-hmm. that's already fixed. And then there's I guess a level more, which like, what about your colleagues and, um, yeah. Your hairdresser. Remember the the, the guy who like, so like he's having, you know, he's having a, um, he's like organizing a party. Like who do you invite today? He's like inviting his hairdresser. He's inviting his GP. He's inviting like his mum. It's just like, you know, I guess it's just a funny example about like how that's a useful thought experiment. Like who, who do you invite to your, like to your birthday party? Um, Yeah. 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 I am um, a part of this. I I think stood out to me as well. Um, I guess interesting for people to like think about is um you know what impact does work have on your energy to do other things? Like how in control do you feel of like the energy you put into your work, and does that like yeah. drain you from other areas of your life? And I think that's that's probably the crux of why I'm quite protective of like you know work hours. You know, yeah. Sometimes yes, I do have to stay late, and I, I kind of accept that as part of the role. Um, but yeah. in general, like I try, like to be quite strict with that. And th- that, that really stands out for me. That's, that's my main crux of what, why I do that is because I want to have enough energy to like yeah. go to the gym after work. I don't want to kind of like have to miss dinner with friends because I've chosen to stay behind at work for yeah. two hours or something. You know, it's a, it's, um, it's just an interesting one to think about, right? It's like, well, you know, you've got yeah, a certain I amount mean, of energy in the day. Like what do you yeah. want to devote it to? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's massive for me. Like, um, after seeing, you know, a handful of client psychotherapy clients throughout the day. Sometimes the last thing I want to do is pick up the phone and call another person. You know, I just need to I want my own space for a bit. But then, mm-hmm. I, as you say, if if that's a repeated pattern, what knock on effect? Not knock on effect. Is that going to have my personal relationships? It's certainly mm-hmm. a, something I haven't really heard talked much about in like on therapy courses or CPD and stuff like that. But it's really interesting and I think really crucial. And expanding that even further to like, what do certain friendships demand of you as well? Yeah. Like what energy and time do certain friends need from you? Like do they, is there an expectation that you'll meet up with them, you know, weekly and have deep, heavy chats with them? Or are there some yeah. 
Yeah, I guess like kind of, I guess as I've gotten older, I like to think that the friends I do have in my life are people who kind of like energize me and kind of provide value and, you know, not, they kind of, uh, I, I get something from them. They, yeah. they give rather than take from me. You know, I think that's a, it's an important question to, to ask ourselves, right? You know, what are, you know, think about the relationships you do have in your life. Like, what are they, how do they fit in line with your values? How do they, you know, how much time do they take up? Like what value do you get from, you know, if you're kind of doing it in like a, a mathematical equation, like yeah. are you being smart with your networks? Are you yeah. generally yeah. putting your time and energy into right places and getting reciprocal, you know, value back from people? Not, yeah. that, not necessarily that it has to be reciprocal <clears throat> every single relationship, but typically like she's saying at the beginning, like deeper relationships tend to be more reciprocal. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, yeah. and I was thinking that when you were saying about, giving and taking like ideally yes we get something from our relationships but ideally they're mutually beneficial right you know we mm. both come out feeling more energized or, or whatever and there's this really important um perhaps reflecting a bit about digital minimalism is that i was thinking about this again watching downton abbey where like they just had the telephone brought in like the first telephone in the house and it's kind of like yeah they'd be sat at dinner and for the first time the telephone would ring and it's like, they would leave dinner to answer it. And it's like, Oh, that's, you know, that it's interesting that started because that, that habit we have of prioritizing the telephone over the real human being in front of us. I've, I've always found mm. that quite curious. And, and obviously as we've got more into like smartphones and stuff, we, we, we've kept the same habits of dropping everything for what's incoming. So like, even when you talk about the, getting post generally you hear the mailbox flop and you go pick up the post and you aren't and you look at it all right yeah very divided fine. attention everyone <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's fine if it's happening you know once a day six days a week but if that's happening every five minutes you, you, we need boundaries which was what the last i guess book we covered digital digital minimalism was about but i guess in, on the back of what you were just saying there if we don't have those boundaries then we're ending up by default prioritizing all this time to stuff that's just grabbing our attention and mm. that's time and energy and empathy and cognition that's been taken away from where else we could channel it which is probably in the relationships that may be more important to us than what's just falling mm. into our inbox mm. um yeah mm. no I, mean, I think i think it just really goes to highlight like kind of being being intentional with your relationships and being yeah, intentional and mindful. Really. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, being understanding like what you're typically drawn to doing, like some people yeah. are typically are drawn to being like expansionists or conveners or brokers, but like, is that serving you? Is that kind of what you, what you want and where is yeah. your energy going? Yeah. And, kind and of I with think that we live awareness. in an age where that's yeah. more important than it ever has been. Like you could get away with not being intentional if you lived in a village you didn't have any smartphones or technology because the age you were growing up in your attention. Yes. Maybe was occasionally grabbed by the postman and the telephone, like in the house, but in general, you could just live unintentionally and your networks would sustain themselves pretty well. Yeah. Whereas wow. Yeah, yeah. 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 In times of COVID and technology, we, we have to be far more boundary than mm. we ever have been before. If we want to like keep that healthy. And definitely back to that digital minimalism, thinking about like what level do we engage with people? You know, he's kind of talking about that mistaking connection for um, communication. You know, are we oh, yeah. are we maintaining our friendships by sending like short text messages every week? Or are we like actively going, calling them, like setting a time to call them or having like a proper deep FaceTime with them yeah. or Skype to actually connect? Yeah. You know, I think especially a question for people, you know, I guess, coming out of COVID and meeting, meeting new people and yeah. Or, you know, kind of um, maintaining friendships that have kind of been online for such a long amount of time. Um, yeah. I know certainly um, in regards to our friendship, having a shared um, a shared project, this yeah. has been been quite integral to, I mean, I'm sure we would have talked, like, but it's more <laughs> like, I think having having like shared interests, shared things to work on, like there's Definitely. some sort of, whether it's um, reciprocal or it's an obligation or whatever you want to, call it like there's some sort of responsibility involved yeah in accountable this in which accountable that's exactly the idea i'm accountable to this project and it kind of uh that's what kind of uh maintains the friendship and i guess without that then 
you know, we would have other ways to connect. But I'm certainly, I yeah. certainly feel like having a shared project, shared interests, and shared level of accountability to each other has maintained this friendship and kept it one of the yeah. one of the deeper, closer ones I have in my life. So it's um, yeah. She said, um, particularly through COVID, that men's relationships have deteriorated more than women's. And she said that's because men tend to connect through shared activities, whereas mm, women tend okay. to connect through conversation. And and um, I, I know it's a broad generalization, but you know you're locked in you're locked in your house. You can still converse with people who pick up the phone. Whereas it's hard, like if you knew all your guy mates through playing sports together or something, or band practice, or shooting some pool at the pub, whatever it was then that's all kind of gone and they're less likely to sort of just pick up the phone and have a chat. Um, and so I guess I remember, off the back yeah. of what you just said, like maybe with you and I having this as a project we do together kind of really just helps maintain the accountability. And as you say, I'm sure we'd speak anyway, but it just keeps that regularity. We know something's always in the diary and that just really helps maintain the relationship. Mm. Mm. I think about, you know, how when I was at a football club, there was like, there's like 50 or 60 blokes I just knew like yeah. we'd catch up and we'd, we'd, we'd yeah. go out after games and we'd yeah. hang out together it was just like yeah it's just you know this is kind of like there's groups and I think she does go on to talk about you know like joining clubs and groups yeah. and things of personal interest it's just like such a good way of meeting people yeah and, um, and how many of them know. do you pick up the phone to to have a chat you know <laughs> yeah yeah, 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 yeah you that, that level you know but then some of my some of my best friends over here have come from that football club so oh, nice uh, yeah 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 which is nice. And then, you know, yeah, just it's just like think about what social circles you straddle. And that's typically the people you tend to be friends with. Like it's not, you know, I was walking down the street the other day looking at, um, I don't know, there's just like a group of people and I just didn't know them. I mean, I'm yeah. not sure how interesting this story is going to be. But I just yeah. remember looking at them. I'm like, after reading this book, I'm like, in what way would I ever become friends with you guys? Yeah. Like yeah, how, yeah. what would be the, um, the instigator for us becoming friends because at the moment yeah. we don't know who each other are yeah like how how could we become friends like is one of you into like reading is one of you like like self-help podcasts do you play yeah. football like yeah yeah th there's so many people in the world that actually we're probably never gonna know or become friends with it's, who would be really compatible about, if we if yeah we did. yeah and to think about like the people we do actually end up with just kind of like tracing back the steps to like how we know each other's actually yeah. there's probably a lot we have in common and um, you know, and th this, I think she talks, you know, earlier on the book about some, like more subtle signs about, you know, kind of, you might like look slightly the same or you're kind of like close to the same age yeah. or you remind them of another friend you've got. Like there's, yeah. there's other like subconscious things at play, but certainly, um, yeah, food, food for thought. I, I think it was a, a really great book. It warmed yeah. on me as it went on. Yeah. Oh, you just triggered something to me when you said yeah. that. So the, she talked, I, she talked about, there was a study on scientific studies um, that had been created in groups of scientists and they looked at like the homogeny of the groups. And so it's like, you know, sometimes the, the, the group who released the paper were, let's say all had Korean surnames, even though they're all from the U S for example, yeah, or like yeah. it was a group of white people that did a study. And it was like, she said that was, it was far more like above and beyond chance that kind of ethnic groups might pull together and maybe in many contexts, but in the scientific world. However, when groups of um, different, both ethnic ethnicities, but also different kind of um, uh, like scientific backgrounds came together, that like the, the, the real breakthrough studies are the ones where people were quite different mm. who came together. Yeah. Um, so, you know, think about brokers ideas. pulling people together. And it was, yeah, it was, it was interesting that although it's less likely to happen, once it does happen, it's more likely to create something novel and creative. Yeah. So the same with mentors as well, that we're more likely to get drawn to mentors who are our same kind of um, race and culture and, and um, uh, sex. Graphic, yeah. But, yeah. but for those who ended up being paired with mentors who were quite different from them in the long run, for whatever reason, tended up to be like better relationships somehow, more mm. fruitful ongoing relationships. Mm. Makes me kind of want to really like try and make some real left field friends for myself. People <laughs> I wouldn't consider wouldn't consider yeah. typically being friends with, or people you know, kind of thinking a bit outside the box and just kind of a uh, maybe trying to deepen 
relationships that might not on the surface look like they've got much potential yeah. in, in that sense you kind of you feel like there's not a lot in common yeah but actually like there might be some some nuggets of wisdom and like a real friendship could blossom from being so different i suppose yeah i guess when yeah. you you meet someone from that same culture and an age and perhaps like socioeconomic background your values can be so aligned that you could just fit right into each other really easily mm. whereas you've got to do a lot more effort if that's not the case and maybe that effort mm. like is part of what makes it uh deeper after the fact because you've both mm. had to really work hard to see each other's worldview yeah nice yeah yeah quite inspiring i'm feeling i'm feeling like i want to kind of, uh, <laughs> deepen my current friendships and uh work on making new ones with uh more diverse group of people i think you know or mm. just kind of or just continually meeting new people if i can and yeah it's good it's good well i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed that yeah. so um yeah i think i think that was a a good one to do I, was, I, I kind of felt like we actually got through everything there without even intending to like there's, there's some really great content they warmed on me as the book went on certainly like after you kind of got through those initial explanations think about kind of like the uh the one-on-one interactions how we put ourselves in the mix stuff around work-life balance yeah um yeah, any, any final takeaways or um, keen to introduce next week's book? Um, no, I think I think I'm done. So, how about yourself? Uh, that, I think that's everything. I'm really. Awesome. I feel like we've really covered everything. I've got nothing. Uh, nothing really to. Yeah, yeah. I could do a summary, but it's all in there. So, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. It yeah. fitted really nicely with um, digital digital minimalism in its own way that I didn't expect. I thought so. Yeah, I, I, that was kind of on my mind when uh, when choosing it. I thought uh, right. about, like networks friendships and the impact of technology on that in particular I yeah suppose. yeah so uh next uh podcast going a bit left field but the book's called unlocking the emotional brain eliminating symptoms at their roots using memory reconsolidation by bruce ecker robin tisich and laurel holly so nice. it's uh, a book that's <laughs> interested yeah. me um Memory reconsolidation is the idea that you can actually, at the synaptic level, um, rewire and undo old emotional memories that uh, currently play out in your life and still give you um, grief and negative symptoms, anxiety, that sort of thing. So our old models from the past that we've built from past negative experiences still play out in our current life. And rather than things like... um, breathing exercises or or countering them with automatic thoughts as you might do in CBT. These people suggest that in the last couple of decades is there's decent research to show that those emotional memories can actually be rewired at the synaptic level and there are techniques to do that. So I'm really fascinated by that. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I think (laughs) when you explain to me, I'm like, it's going to be, I think it's going to be another, um, another one that kind of like tests our knowledge, you know, I think it'd be really good process to kind of, uh, kind of try and re-explain it to each other and um, yeah. see what shared understanding we can have about it so it's going to be a challenging one so I imagine uh, it might take us uh, t- two or three weeks to get through that one yeah. <laughs> to, right, less but um, no, awesome awesome to catch up again mate and uh, yeah really lovely to keep doing these with this uh, we'll just keep cracking on ne- yeah, on to yeah. the next book love yeah. it cheers mate right, see you mate all the best take care bye bye bye